friend once uh, said, uh, Vanguard is right here, okay, but in a birdly point. Hush, 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 hush. Hush. <laughs> My name is Chris Mansour. I'm the moderator here. for this event. We have Josh Decker from the International Bolshevik Tendency to speak about his organization and then answer any questions that you, the friendly audience, may have for him. Um, so we'll begin with his introductory remarks and then we'll move to the floor. So uh, thank you and please uh, welcome Josh. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to Platypus. What is the International Bolshevik Tendency? Our predecessor organization, the once revolutionary Spartacist League, has answered that question by writing that the IBT is, quote, a vicious gang of crazed, God-failed renegades, <laughs> eager to serve the purposes of those who would like to destroy us. Elsewhere, proclaiming that garbage doesn't walk by itself, the SL wrote, quote, mainly the BT is a highly dubious and potentially extremely dangerous pest of the Cointel prototype, unquote. Trotsky uh, was subjected to worse slanders by the Stalinists, and of course Lenin was characterized as a hireling of the Kaiser by the Social Democrats. So we're in good company, I think. Of course, to properly answer the question, what is the IBT, a bit of history is required. Between 1951 and 1953, the Fourth International was destroyed as a liquidationist current, headed by Michel Pablo, declared that there was no point in building independent revolutionary proletarian parties and that it was necessary to burrow deep inside reformist and alien class formations in an effort to push them to the left. Opposing this adaptationist current was a loose grouping organized into the International Committee, the IC, whose principal components were the USSWP, led by James P. Cannon, the British SLL, led by Jerry Healy, and the French PCI, led by Pierre Lambert. Now, Cannon's SWP, which had benefited from uh, close collaboration with Trotsky before his assassination, was perhaps best positioned to lead the fight against capitalism. Yet its performance was marred by parochialism and a rightward drift which within 10 years led it to reunify with the Pavlovites on the basis of a shared, uncritical enthusiasm for Fidel Castro and his petty bourgeois guerrilla movement. Opposition to fusion with Pablo was led by Tim Wolforth, James Robertson, and the small revolutionary tendency, or RT, which was <laughs> highly critical of the liquidationist policy of the Dobbs uh, leadership on Cuba and also towards the pacifism of the civil rights movement. Wolfort broke with the RT, which was periodically expelled from the SWP and emerged as the Spartacist League in 1964. Now, the Spartacist League struggled not only to preserve revolutionary continuity, but also sought to regroup with the best elements of the ostensibly Trotskyist milieu internationally on the basis of a program that restored the revolutionary vigor and consistency of the early Fourth International, and addressed the changed context of the post-World War II era, in particular the need to unconditionally defend the new deformed border states, Cuba, China, North Korea, Yugoslavia, and so on, while fighting for proletarian political revolutions to oust the ruling Stalinist bureaucracies. Most people, I think it's safe to assume in this room, uh, are familiar with the SL only in its highly degenerated uh, form. Yet the Spartacist League of the 1960s and 1970s was a very different political animal. It recruited dozens of self-sacrificing young communists from the decomposing new left, whose self-confidence and energy were rooted in a deep understanding of the Trotskyist program, which through the pages of Works Vanguard, and other high-quality publications was applied to the burning questions of the day. This included paying special attention to the oppressed uh, oppression suffered by women and blacks, without giving any political support to any bourgeois tendencies such as feminism or black nationalism. The Sparsis League was the only organization on the U.S. left to warn against the class collaborationism of the Chilean Popular Front, and it was also alone in calling for uh, opposition to both the Shah and Khomeini in Iran in 1979. 
while defending all neocolonial countries against imperialist attack. During the Vietnam War, the SL opposed the pacifism prevalent in the anti-war movement and sided unambiguously with the Viet Cong against U.S. imperialism. While many left groups in this period worked inside the unions, they tended to engage either in sectarian antics or opportunist maneuvering with out-of-office bureaucrats, sometimes combined with amorphous rank-and-file groupings. By contrast, SL supporters sought to build programmatically based caucuses by using Trotsky's transitional program as adapted to the particular situation. In some unions, SL supporters built a real base, which was reflected in impressive levels of support in union elections. By the mid-1970s, Spartacist trade unionists initiated labor actions, helping launch workers' defense guards. In a couple of cases, and in several unions, longshore, uh, maritime, and communications, have become recognized as the leftist opposition to the uh, national bureaucracy. We detail this work in our 1998 edition of the Transitional Program, which is available on our website. Now, tragically, this work fell victim to the process of bureaucratic degeneration experienced by the Spartacists. <coughs> Even by the early 1970s, the SL had become a somewhat harder organization than it had been in the 1960s. Results of bitter factional struggles and the departure of older cadres, like Jeff White, who had, as peers of Robertson, helped to offset his inclination to what he liked to describe as his angular approach to politics. Yet the hardness of the Robertson school at this stage was still within the acceptable parameters of Leninist operational norms, albeit at one end of the spectrum, with cannons and SWP located somewhere uh, near or at the center. As working class militancy in the U.S. proceeded by the late 1970s, however, Robertson's outlook began to change. Seeing the prospects for revolutionary breakthroughs evaporating, and unmatched in authority inside the International Spartacist Tendency, or IST, Robertson increasingly began to focus on shoring up the news base of the organization and eliminating potential challenges to his leadership position. The hardness of the earlier period began morphing into something far more disturbing, political cultism. A whole layer of cadres, among the best and most independent-minded in the organization, was purged in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Increasingly bizarre accusations, often with sexual overtones, were hurled at targeted comrades, who in some extreme instances were asked to demonstrate their loyalty to the organization by resigning from it. The highest profile purge, in this case of Bill Logan, took the form of an elaborate show trial replete with hysterical denunciations and a verdict that found the accused guilty of, quote, crimes against communist morality, unquote. Around this time, Robertson began to liquidate the group's trade union work as he feared that comrades with even a small base in the labor movement were potentially dangerous to his unquestioned authority in the party. The few comrades who refused to tear up these precious toeholds in the workers' movement were predictably driven out of the group. Although the IST was exhibiting some signs of political gyration, its formal commitment to a revolutionary program <coughs> was a source of great confusion by the victims of Robinson's bureaucratic purges. 